All right, for segment one today, we are going to talk about item crafting, crafting of items in absolute power. Items, just like uh, many, well, pretty much everything else with your character, are attributes. Now, there's a caveat to that, but we'll get into that. But they're attributes. But because items are items, and they can be taken away, damaged, destroyed, whatever, uh, they cost half the points. Now, we're going to get into all the nuances of that, uh, in terms of, well, if it can be destroyed, why do I have to pay any points at all? Versus, you know, wow, half the points, uh, what are the weaknesses of them? And we're going to get into that here in just a moment. What, what is up with me today? <laughs> Like I, I have energy. I'm just not projecting it. It's so weird. It's so weird. So. All right. So. Promise you, I have energy. In fact, I was shaking just a moment ago. It's not so much caffeine. Um, maybe I'm crashing. I'm crashing. Do, 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 do. Items in gear. 229. Yep, chapter 10. Now, there is a pretty big distinction, and I'm sure the book will get into it, because I know Bessem did, uh, about the difference between having just mundane items and what items and gear entails. So, what would a superhero game be without the impossible weapons, sleek vehicles, powered armor, wondrous artifacts, and high-tech toys that so many characters wield in their adventures? This chapter provides further context for the item attribute, which you may have assigned to your character during his creation. You will find a wide range of example items across the power spectrum that can either be used as they are or used as templates to assist you in creating a plethora of weapons and vehicles for use in your game. And that will be the next video. We're not going to dive into every item, but uh, we're going to look over armor. We're going to look over weapons. We're going to look over gadgets, but that's going to be in the next video. Of course, these list examples are not exhaustive, and that's one of the fun things about a point-based game. If you want to make something, as long as you have enough points to do it, you can make whatever you want. Just like you can make whatever hero you want, you can make whatever items and gear you want within the limitation of the amount of points you have. Obviously, you can't make the world-ending <laughs> uh, nuclear bomb that is immune to everything, yada, 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 if you don't have enough points to do that. You, know, you can't, can't put a shield around the Earth to prevent the world-ending <laughs> nuclear bomb that is impervious to literally everything except for oxygen you know, without having the points to do that. So you got to play within the points, but other than that, if you can imagine it, you can make it. And that's what's awesome about point-based games like this. Uh, an exhaustive uh, attribute is limited only by... Yeah, there we go. Okay, of course, this, these listed examples are not exhaustive since the item attribute is limited only by your imagination. Many real-world variations exist for the generic weapons and equipment provided herein. Just remember that getting the right feel for your items is more important than ensuring the point costs are perfect. Tell that to any champions player. They will disagree with you. <laughs> uh, all right. When designing an item for your character, there are numerous guidelines you need to consider. Since your vision for your item may be different from the GM's vision, it is important to discuss the item specifics with the GM during the creation to ensure you're on the same page in advance of your adventures. All right. So, you want to make the world-ending nuke? The GM might be like, yeah, no. Or there might be a couple of different powers that could facilitate what it is that you're trying to do. Work with the Game Master. Find out uh, you know, what fits the setting, what fits the tone of the campaign, and uh, go from there. Absolute power is an effects-based system. This means that if one character is a high-caliber pistol and his opponent can fire an equally damaging energy bolt out of his hands, it would make sense that both characters should pay the same character point cost for the ability to inflict equivalent damage on their enemies. Now, this is something that you've heard me say over and over again during this series, but I... When I played Champions back in the 90s, I could not grasp that concept. I also say this. I don't understand. I don't know why. I can't get in that same frame of mind. I could not grasp that concept. To me, no. Those had to be two separate abilities. They had to be two separate powers. They can't be the same thing. <laughs> because energy is stopped by this, but a bullet is not you know, stopped by that. You know, whatever. It's like, no, those are advan or, uh, what was it? limiters. Uh, what are they called in this game? Oh, my God. Limiters and enhancements, uh, 
And I'm like, no, no, there's literally different things. It's like, I don't know. I, again, I don't get it. But no, they're the same thing. If a bullet does a D6 damage, I know that's not how this game works. We'll just go with it. And, a, and an energy bolt does a D6 damage. It's the same thing. Costs the same points. Now, armor penetrating bullet, uh, uh, energy bolt that's uh, deflected by some sort of shield or whatever. Now you're starting getting to the enhancements and limiters that uh, that vary, vary the concept. I mean, if you literally have... Again, we're talking spending the exact same amount of points. And you call it a bullet and I call it a fireball. They're going to be resisted by the same thing. They're going to be immune to the same thing. They're going to damage the same things because they are the same thing. They just have a different mask or color or flavor over it. Don't get hung up on the fact that, no, fire fire is put out by water. Well, not not in the way you spent your points. No. So uh, just just remember that. Uh, so yeah, they tend to also be somewhat obvious and are not always available to their owners. As a result, item costs half as many character points as an equivalent amount of abilities built into the character to account for the inherent disadvantages they impose. So somewhat obvious. Now you remember champions, I know I'm talking to a lot of champions fans here, but, uh, uh, obvious inaccessible focus. Uh, what was it? Is it inobvious accessible fo or inaccessible folks? I mean, they had those different categories, right? Well, here it's just, hey, they're somewhat obvious and are not always available to their owners. I think later on, at least I hope later on, because it doesn't best them, it talked about don't be a jerk and make it so the character can never have access to it, destroy it or whatever, because then the person wasted points. And that's not what the intent of this is. So, um, it, character creation, it's a. Uh, it's spent at character creation. So if you played champions, it's the same basic thing. If you have not played champions, well, basically you make a hundred point character and you spend all those points to determine what the character can and can't do uh, across the board, everything. And so items are the same thing. A again, I'm not saying you should. I'm just saying if somebody ha understands the hero system, which is what champions is based on, you understand this system. If you they just uh, use different mechanics in terms of, you know, try stat versus whatever the hero system calls its actual action mechanic stuff. But it's the same concept. Um, you know, I'm, I'm making up numbers here, but if it costs 10 points to have a gun with a bullet, it's going to cost 10 points to have a gun with a fireball that does the, the same thing as a bullet. So. Now, you, you'll gain character points throughout your character's career. So, like experience points, right? So, you can convert that into an item. So maybe you start off as a guy who's got a little bit of body armor and a small gun, but instead of turning yourself yourself into a superhero, into like a, a Wolverine or into a Green Lantern or something, you just make your power armor that much more powerful every step across the way. The thing is, is like we tell the Palladium folks and their Glitter Boys, there are going to be times when you don't get to be in the Glitter Boy. <laughs> uh, shared items. The GM may allow... A group of characters to own a single important item. For example, a giant robot, battleship, satellite-based street vehicle, or unique artifact. In common and even in common and evenly split. Oh, I see. Okay, he did that. Oh, I see where he did that. Okay, single important item in common, comma, and evenly split the character points among themselves. Companions may not contribute to the shared item cost. Companions are going to be the full segment two today, since Heathen Dog's not here. So we will talk about companions uh, at that time. Uh, record a shared item in a character's description and clearly indicate its ownership and character point cost. For example, one sixth of the Union Pulse Carrier Primrose. Item health points. An, item, an item's health points are equivalent to its armor rating, which in turn is determined by its material composition. In other words, hard and tough items, a high armor ratings, are also quite durable and able to withstand significant damage. Usually an item's health, health points do not play a role in adventures, but can be useful should you want to track damage to objects, you know, for the purpose of breaking items. Dramatic narrative damage to objects and background building landscapes can maintain story immersion better than tracking detailed minutiae. That's not a license for a game master just to say, ha ha, destroying all your stuff every time. Take away your horses again. Hee hee. <laughs> but it could make a compelling story. Complete invulnerability to physical harm can be represented by level 10 of the immunity attribute, which would typically be assigned the object limiter three or four times. 
An item with an extremely high immunity level should rarely have multiple immutable attribute levels assigned as well, unless the item also has defects that opponents can exploit to circumvent the defensive. So, you know, you got your Death Star out there. Psh, you can't hurt that thing. Oh, except for it does have the weakness. Everything has to have a port that you can shoot a bomb into and destroy it, right? Of course, a player who's invested character points to make an item unbreakable has elevated that item to a fundamental aspect of the character's concept. The item's destruction should be an exceptional dramatic occurrence only managed by enemies or artifacts of overwhelming power. The loss of such noteworthy items should be driven by the adventure narrative, and it should have specific purpose, most often to prove that the character is far more than a mere item, even a legendary one. Uh, defects associated with an item. Now, defects are going to work the same. Uh, you know, just to get, we'll, we're, we'll look at point totals here in just a moment, but they work the same as character defects. So, defects associated with an item usually only affect the character if the character is using the item. For example, if a gas mask restrict, restricts peripheral vision and is assigned one rank of the sensory impairment defect, worth minus three points, the character's vision is only impaired when he's wearing the mask. Additionally, defects that are implied by the item status as an inanimate object, such as impaired manipulation, impaired speech, mark, own, etc., 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 should not be assigned unless they indicate specific deficiencies. For example, a rickety spaceship with the instruments that sometimes fail to work properly, that's got to be fun, might have the physical impairment defect. So we're talking about a ship with the physical impairment defect. And, you know, right when you need, <laughs> how far away is it? I don't know. It's not working. Tap it harder. Um, items that grant power-related attributes such as dynamic powers can also have defects like vulnerability that prevent the use of those attributes. You can actually have a defect that you can't use. The ship just does not get to light speed. Doesn't work. We're still trying to fix it. Naked enhancements and the features attribute. Now, this I don't know anything about. You can design some items with only enhancements, usually weapon attribute enhancements, but others can also be used with GM permission. For example, a gun scope has an accurate enhancement that makes it easier to hit targets, while a vibration amplification system could add the area enhancement to attributes that function through the use of sound waves. Such naked enhancements are part of the feature attribute on a page 82, which we are long past. Uh, we could look at that, but we're not going to. Now, mundane items. What's We're going to find out now what the difference is between mundane items and these items that you spent points for. Why do you have to spend points on a gun if it's just laying on the ground? Well, do you have to spend points on a gun if you find it just laying on the ground? Mundane items are items that are so unimportant, every day are ubiquitous for the purposes of an adventure, for the purpose of an adventure, that the GM decides that they are free. In our own world, things like clothes, television, wristwatches, smartphones, family homes, etc. can be classed as mundane items. This decision is largely based on use. A car can be classed as a mundane item for one character, who uses as background detail, but an actual item for another character who uses it all the time during critical game moments. The GM may instead decide that some items are best acquired through the gear or features attribute instead of being free. Only a single such attribute level at, co at a cost of one point may be considered free anyway. Once the point cost is halved as part of the item attribute, since it is rounded down. Oh, I didn't realize that. Okay, so a one point cost item is rounded down. All right. Character po Okay, this is where I think it's going to say GMs don't be jerks. Character point protection rule. All items benefit from the character point protection rule, while mundane items do not. Character point protection means that if an item is important enough to cost character points, it is part of the character's concept. The GM should ensure the item is replaced within the next game session if the item is lost, stolen, broken, or broken, provided this will not upset the logic of the story. Mundane items do not benefit from this replacement guideline, and they may be taken from the character as appropriate. Players may use character points to acquire otherwise mundane items should they wish to benefit from such point protection if the mundane items are important to the character's concept. All right, not going to get in that second half there, but the first half of this is essentially like, hey, if you've got, you know, the Sword of Doom and you, you spent character points on it, generally speaking, you should keep that item. If for whatever reason, 
it is taken, it is broken, it is, is lost, you know, whatever. Then by the next session, you should have it back, unless it's relevant to the story that you don't. Maybe the story is about recovering the item. In that case, that's, that's a different idea. But what you don't want to have happen is that characters spend, or players spend a lot of points for an item for their characters, where you're just taking the stuff away. And what's, what's the point of spending, you know, I thought it's more powerful, it's more useful than I wanted it to be. Well, that's, that's a different issue. And you can work around that, but you shouldn't be taking it away. And if you do, ultimately, give the character the points back. If it's going to be a permanent removal, give the character the points back. Or if it's going to be something that's so long-term, you know, I didn't have this for three months, well, at least give the character the points back for three months. So, items versus gear. Uh, so if you have an AI assistant that costs character points and you lose your, uh, lose your mundane cell phone, uh, you you probably have different access to it. Maybe somebody else has a cell phone to it. Uh, you might be diving a little too deeply into that, although I don't know. that. Uh, again, I don't generally play point-by games. So uh, if you have an AI assistant, if it costs character points, I would think that you'd have multiple ways of getting into it or accessing it. Uh, you lose your uh, smartphone, maybe you've got a smartwatch also. Uh, yeah, sure, if everything is stripped from you, then yeah, you got to get your smartphone or smartwatch or Google Glass or whatever they're calling it now, <laughs> you know, back. But uh, yeah, you can absolutely temporarily be separated from even your your point buy items. But if that cell phone is part of the character concept, where it's a requirement for the AI that that's the access to the AI, I would make that a an item that costs points. And then that becomes the item that the character isn't without for a long time. I, I, again, there's this balance between the narratives. It's, the fact that they can be taken away is why they cost half the points. But taking it away constantly just basically means that the character wasted a bunch of points. So there's, there's a balance in there. And sure, sometimes characters are going to complain the second. Look, you just took my, my sort of doom from me. Not, now what am I supposed to do? Other things? Figure it out? You should be more than just the Sword of Doom. Now, if that's like a, well, a He-Man kind of thing, like without uh, you know, the Sword of Doom, uh, you, can't, uh, you can't turn into He-Man, well, that's a pretty big deal, isn't it? Now you got an adventure. So, But that shouldn't be a permanent state. That's the point. So for a modern campaign, whether something should be purchased as gear rather than an item is a simple question. Can someone buy and or create the object easily in our world? If the answer is yes, then it should be available as gear through similar attributes like connected, wealth, or features. Super technology or magical wonders that surpass modern equipment should always be items. Players and GMs should take note that the character point protection rule does not apply equally to all such equipment. Anything acquired with the item attribute may be subject to temporary damage or loss, though most in instances will be limited to a short absence. Of course, the reason for an item's half-price cost reduction is that they can be stolen or disabled, so temporary issues can arise when faced with cunning or powerful foes. Equipment acquired with gear attribute has the second greatest level of protection. Gear is equipment with realistic advantages and limitations. If a character has also purchased the combat technique concealment or portable armory, the character's versions of the equipment might be smaller like Caliburn's miniature smoke clusters, but they will have identical utility. Gear is vulnerable to superpowers like telekinesis or transmute and can be damaged in combat with more ease than items, but their ubiquity makes them easy to replace as well. Equipment that is legally restricted to military or police forces should require some level of connected in addition to gear, unless the character already has the wanted defect in relation to the local government. So what, what those are, that's a rule that's just put in there for some simple like, hey, you don't get to own a tank, even though you spend gear points on it, because the government isn't going to allow you to do that <laughs> unless you, are, you belong to a military, you know, maybe you're a superhero for a military organization or something like that. So, or you're wanted because you're a criminal, because you're driving the, on the streets with a tank, ruining the roads.
Equipment created or assembled from material components through the use of dynamic powers or power flux. And those are the weird ones. Those are the ones that I don't like to get into. Uh, falls into the gear level of protection. As appropriate, uh, oh, sorry, an appropriate sphere of influence for dynamic powers may allow for rapid reassembly of any damaged item. Okay, so if it's a dynamic power and somehow it breaks or whatever, you can utilize that the dynamic power ability to recreate the item, fix it, put it back together again, Lego that thing, something. For example, Slipstream uses both his extra actions and quick tech category for dynamic powers to rapidly assemble or reconfigure equipment as needed during an encounter. Similarly, PowerFlux permits any object created through its use to be rebuilt within minutes, barring any limiters placed on either attribute. And if you remember, limiters are the things that, uh, well, they limit you. So maybe there's a limiter on there that says you can't do it in minutes, or you have to have the right uh, equipment, or you know, multiple other facets that you can put on. They can only be done you know, when the sun is up. You can only sacrifice virgins at the full moon, or whatever. Uh, and that's an important character element of Artificer. Combining the connected attribute with the gear attribute can justify the deployment of almost any equipment available, depending on the organization. Connected, wealth, and features provide the least item protection without the gear attribute. So if you have those, but you don't have the gear attribute, you have a little bit of item protection, but it isn't going to be to the same extent. Well, they still offer some plot defense to various equipment. The GM can make bases, vehicles, and especially weapons unavailable if their absence advances the story. Olympian Tower and Empire City is almost never threatened. When Hod the Fair Shadow, or Hod and Fair Shadow, invaded Earth in 2005 and 2020, respectively, they're able to deny the guards their home. I'm sorry, deny the guard their home's protection. Enemies do not destroy Mercury jets every time the guard deploys, but no insurance company on Earth will cover them. <laughs> Fair enough. Slipstream has learned to stop borrowing coil rifles from Wardenclyffe given how soon villains destroy them after his acquisitions. Excuse me a second. All right. And the point there is to say, like, hey, you can't, can't bypass the system by not creating gears by, or, or items. Uh, if you're going to use these other attributes, remember, attributes are just talents, skills, things, abilities, your superpowers, and so forth tied to your character. Uh, if you're going to use these attributes, yes, uh, you can get things, especially with the connected attribute. Great. You got the connected attribute. Uh, you, you know people and you can get things. But, you know, when the, when the inventor or, you know, when Q makes so many items and you keep getting them destroyed, Q's probably going to be, you know what, I'm not getting, no, no, you can't have this anymore. <laughs> I, I can't make enough of them to keep up with your shenanigans. So if you need that spe specific item, well, it's time to make it as an item. Given the right resources and skills, characters could build items without paying points for them. Unless this advances the plot, as with the case for a single-use device intended to thwart a villain's master plan, such objects prove extremely fragile when confronted with the adventure plot. As frustrating as this may be for players, it is the bane of every supervillain. Uh... Kreutzruder has built the magma cannon six times since World War II, each version destroyed before he could fire it more than twice. Mr. Matthews turns out god beast by the duns, dozens, with most contained by the government or Ascension Institute within hours of their deployment. Janus crafts death traps on a regular basis only to watch superheroes tear them apart. So, the point here again is that, yes, the Game Master is allowed to, uh, to counter your nonsense, especially with well-prepared or uh, supervillains. Like, okay, I know, it's, it's like, uh, what's Lex Luthor and Superman, right? At least in terms of the movies. Lex Luthor always seems to have kryptonite. <laughs> he, he knows Superman's weakness, so he's not going to try to confront Superman without uh, a little bit of kryptonite. You know, of course, he's going to, you know, keep himself, you know, Free from harm, we'll say, so he'll make sure that the kryptonite is at the bottom of a pool, <laughs> right? Where Superman doesn't see it, or isn't isn't expecting it, I should say. And then he'll uh, step forth, you know, and say, "Well, you're just a normal person now that's wearing some silly spandex." So you, as your character, absolutely, if it's a, a researched villain or a villain who does his research, absolutely could start nullifying some of what you do. 
Advanced game settings offer hyper-technology equipment options, including blasters, personal force fields, and starships. One set of options, canonical to Sentinel Earth, which is, you know, this is obviously uh, the, exp or the second edition of Silver Age Sentinels, so Sentinel Earth is the core setting here, is provided as a set of examples for interstellar civilizations later in the chapter. Members of all major spacefaring societies in Sentinel Earth's Milky Way can purchase that technology as gear if playing in an appropriate adventure. So if you're doing a spacefaring campaign, you can have a spacefaring ship. Makes sense. What's the point of spending money on a spacefaring ship if you're going to be doing everything in Empire City? Make the right gear for the right job. In narratives based on Earth, limited access might be permissible for characters who acquire authority in such organizations uh, through Connected. GMs can naturally revoke membership to a resource network if a character abuses it. All right, base of operations. Characters can also acquire a non-mobile headquarters as an item. Though this isn't recommended unless the character's team will gain significant benefit from it during adventures. So this is your... Uh, oh my god, I can't remember the name of it. I was thinking the Super Friends thing. Uh <laughs> I can't, yeah, I can't remember the name of it. Anyway, it says headquarters if you want. Technically, Super Team headquarters do have a point cost. Characters like Mr. Matthews and members of the Guard pay for these points through Connected and Wealth. A Super Team's base need not cost anything beyond those attributes. If the team does not have either Connected or Wealth, like the Untouchables, then they'll have to make do with whatever they can find, like a beat-up minibus. <laughs> or uh, the mystery mystery machine. For wealthier or better connected heroes, a stationary base of operations is a convenient background element. In most cases, it's simply not useful enough during adventures for game masters to insist on spending character points to have one. A base is there for heroes to feel safe when they're making plans or hanging out, and for them to feel threatened when their most terrible foes penetrate their defenses and ravage their homes. Hall of Justice, thank you. Can you tell I, I need Heathen Dog here to talk superhero stuff? Because... I don't know crap about superheroes. All right, then it talks about equipment modifications. Okay, that's all we're going to talk about in this first video. In the next video, we're going to actually look over some of these. We are not going to spend a lot of time on this. I don't know how long the next video is going to be. I could theoretically merge it into this one at this point, but uh, I already had it planned for uh, a second, second video, so we'll do that. But uh, yeah, as you see, we'll have weapons, we'll have armor, we'll have a whole bunch of gadgets, and we'll look over some of them in the next one. And I would say I'm going to read Super Chats, but I'm not going to read Super Chats. We didn't get any, and I've already read the other comments <laughs> as they popped up, because uh, it was easy to do today. So I guess all I'm going to say now then is, uh, since I find my button, uh, where's my button? There we go. It's boop. There we go. Please like, subscribe, and share. That video is actually a little shorter than I thought it was going to be, but I, I think it makes sense. The The idea of items is they're just attributes. And if you're like sitting here confused, okay, I don't know what the heck an attribute is. Well, you can check that out in earlier videos, but it's literally, if you can, if you have eye beams, that's an attribute. If you have super strength, that's an attribute. If you have, if you're connected with uh, you know, the mafia, that's an attribute. If you have a certain skill set that is pertinent to your character, like your Dick Tracy style investigator, that's an attribute. Well, your item, in a sense, is its own attribute, but it has attributes tied to it. Is the better way to look at it. The item, in in a sense, is it's half a character. <laughs> okay, it's it's like it's like your character that you assign attributes to. But again, everything costs half the points so hopefully you understand that and if not we'll ask the questions in comments and i will try to answer them as best i can else i will see you in the next video